Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. How many people here know that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine? Anybody? Yeah? Good deal. Because this morning, we're going to have some fun. So at the church here, uh, we like to say that we're doing life together, and we're better together. And so the more you get to know somebody, the more, I don't know, you can be in tune with them, what's going on in their lives. And so this morning, we're going to test you all on how well you know Pastor Cindy. And if you get the right answer, you get to pick all kinds of swag that's up here. <laughs> so we've got about eight or ten skill testing questions. And you answer it correctly, you get to run up here and grab whatever you like. 
All right. <laughs> Is there what? Can yeah, because she may not know all the answers. <laughs> all right. So like I said, the more you get to know somebody, the more you can appreciate them, the more you can be a blessing to them. Now, I've been struggling to make this fair because I believe we've got some newcomers this morning, and I want it to be fair to everyone. So newcomers, get ready, because this question is for you. Does anybody in the newcomer section know John 3.16? Put up your hand. John 3.16? No. Okay, good, good. The good-looking guy with the beard, come on <laughs> up and grab some swag. How is that for trying to be fair? <laughs> so... This comes from Deer Valley Meadows, which is a uh, camp we have in uh, Alberta. So go ahead, grab anything with the exception of this one. This was donated, and, uh, but you're more than welcome to grab that as well. So <laughs> hoodies, T-shirts, or... All right. Thank, and what's your name? Pavel. Pavel. Nice to meet you. I'm Mark. Good to have you. All right. Well, I tried. I tried to include everybody. I hope that wasn't too difficult a question. All right, question number one. Get ready. Get your hands ready. How old was your pastor when she accepted Jesus? Ho! Oh, four. Come on up. Hallelujah. Hoodie, T-shirt, or stainless steel mug? <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Skill testing question number two. How well do you know your pastor? Get your hands ready. What organization did she train with in Hawaii? Come on up, Mr. John the Baptist. <laughs> you can't take this T-shirt, though. <laughs> <laughs> T-shirts or mugs, whatever you'd like. Ooh. All right. Thank you, John. <laughs> Question number three. Oh, this is a tough one. Uh, Mama might not even know this one. Here we go. Get your hands ready. What three states did our pastor live in during her great adventures in the states? Anybody? Go for it. Well, if I take a combined answer, <laughs> you're right on two, and John's right on three. All right, so come on up and grab something. Thank you, Randy. Oh, this is fun. All right. How well do you know your pastor? Here we go. Question number four. Did your pastor ever go to England? If so, why? Tick tock, tick tock. Say what? Ah, close, close, close. Your pastor did spend time in England. She was doing a school of worship there. On staff, yeah. What? On staff of a Yeah, on staff. Huh. Things you learn about your pastor today. Nobody gets a prize on that one. Okay, here's an easier one. My mom might know this one. <clears throat> Where was our pastor's father born? And for a bonus, if you know why he came to Canada. Oh, no, 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 Mama. Okay. Anybody? Okay. Yes? Yes? No. One more at the back. I think, Craig, I think I saw your hand go up. Okay. 
but you didn't get part two. Why did he come to Canada? Yes, come on up. Very good. Uh, we got a large and an extra large and Don't say that into the mic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we love. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Our pastor has been on two, well, actually more, but two mission trips to Africa. What country was she in when she was in Africa? I'm so sorry, new time, first timers. I mean, I wasn't ready for you guys this morning. It starts with a U. <laughs> they all get something. <laughs> Did you say Uganda? All right. T-shirt or a mug? Mug, I'm throwing it at you. No, I'm, <laughs> it's here when you're ready. All right, good answer. We've got two prizes left. Here we go. How did your pastor meet her knight in shining armor? <laughs> yes. Bonus points if you know which website. No. Get ready. Get ready. Christian dating for free. <laughs> Come on up, Betty Ann. Dot com. <laughs> oh, you, you, I think you have to say. Wow. No, no. Yeah. I don't know. All right. We're just about done because I only have one prize left. Let's see here. Um, shall we make it easy or hard? What's everybody say? Hard? I have one hard. Okay. All right. Here we go. How many emails did her knight in shining armor and Pastor Cindy send back and forth in 22 months before they met face to face? More. More. Close. 9,000 emails. Rob, come on up and grab a t-shirt. And for all you math nuts out there, that's on average 16 emails a day for 22 months. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for playing. That was kind of fun. Uh, Open us in prayer. Open us in prayer. Yeah. She says we need to pray after that. <laughs> Amen. All right. Father God, we just love you and appreciate you, and your word is true and real. We stand on your word here. We don't compromise. We just love you. And we want to, uh, with every passing day, become more and more like you. We want to be a light into this dark world. So, Father God, I just pray right now for our pastor and our music leader and for each and every person that is here or listening online that they have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to them today so that they can be bigger and brighter and represent God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's stand together.
Well, amen. How many of you know we are family here? Amen. Amen. I remember when my uh, parents would get to go on uh, a very rare honeymoon getaway on their own without us kids. And this was way back in the day, you know, when our money was worth more than the U.S. money. They would go down to Spokane. And uh, we would be, uh, be waiting with... Um, anticipation because we always knew that mom and dad would come back with some kind of a prize or gift for us. So um, yeah, the swag that you guys got this morning was just a, a little way of uh, Mark and I just saying how much we love doing life together with you. We did have an amazing time at Equip a couple of weeks ago with um, our regional ministries and then a little bit of time of uh, prayer retreat. Um, just uh, soaking in the Lord at Deer Valley Meadows. So um, you guys are loved. Amen. We are uh, working our way through a series entitled The Resurrected Life. The Resurrected Life. This morning's message is entitled Leave Nothing on the Table. Leave Nothing on the Table. Luke chapter 14 verses 16 through 24 reads this way. <clears throat> Jesus replied, oh, yeah, kids, um, you guys get to head on downstairs if you'd like with the teachers. I know there's some awesome crafts and snacks and fun stuff and great Bible lessons that you guys are going to get in on. So good to see some new kids in the house today. Bless you guys. All right, back to Luke. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. How many of you like to have a party? Do, do you like to have a, a party with many guests? Uh, sometimes it's nice to just do one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two -two or whatever. But um, this guy was having a big party. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. How many of you grew up with a mama that when, it, when dinner was ready, it was ready, it was hot, it was on the table, and it was time to be seated at the table now? Anybody? I am one of those mamas. <laughs> and when my kids delay getting there, I'm not impressed when the, the food is getting cold. That's how I grew up. Everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please, excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Can you say new car? <laughs> Please, excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. <clears throat> not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus is telling a parable here. It's an analogy of what's going on around him. Scripture tells us that Jesus came unto his own, that he came unto his own, but his own recognized him not. The ones who should have been celebrating his arrival were the ones who were pushing back and persecuting him. And the tax collectors and the prostitutes the poor, the needy, the people who had no illusions about where they were in life were coming into the kingdom faster than the spiritual elite. Save the excuses. It's not about having time. It's about making 
time. If it matters, you will make time. Can you agree? Does that ring true? We usually find, make the time to do the things we want to, the things that we feel are important to us. I want us to understand this morning, I'm not preaching at you. (laughs) I'm preaching to us. I'm preaching to myself. Because the time is critical. The times are urgent. The definition of leaving something on the table is to refrain from taking the utmost advantage of something, to not address every aspect of a situation. For example, in the form of leaving money on the table, negotiating a deal that is less financially beneficial than is expected or possible. You have a house that you're going to sell. And your realtor or somebody who's wise says, you know what? Paint's peeling on the outside. Might be a good idea to give it a fresh coat of paint inside and out. Or to replace that worn out shag carpet from the 70s. And you decide, ah, that's just too much energy. And you end up leaving thousands and thousands of dollars on the table. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. that you are very much alive. Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Right now, your word says that you are interceding for us. You're interceding, Lord, for those who have yet to come into relationship with you. All over this world, the Holy Spirit is moving, and Lord God, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world. We lift up, Lord God, uh, our brothers and sisters and those who have yet to know you in the Ukraine who are suffering, Lord God. The warfare that is going on between Russia and the Ukraine, Lord, and we know that there are people who are suffering in Russia as well. God, we thank you that you are not a respecter of of persons, but that you love everyone. You love everyone, Lord God. And so we thank you that in the midst of chaos and turmoil and sorrow and suffering, you are very much at work. Lord, we ask that the gospel would go forth, the good news, and that in the midst, Lord, of grief and mourning, that peace might be found the eye of the storm. Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we need you to anoint our ears. Open up our ears, Lord God. Open up our eyes. I thank you that you've anointed your word in my mouth, Lord God, and that as we listen, your Holy Spirit, who is our teacher and guide, is going to unpack some things for us this morning. So we say that we love you, Lord. We need you. This is your house. These are your people. We're here at your pleasure, Lord. Amen. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes, John the Baptist, John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with or in water for repentance. 
But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This isn't really a popular scripture that you find being preached about a whole lot in pulpits these days. But what is going on? John the Baptist is Jesus' older cousin by six months. He himself is a miracle baby. And he's a little strange. We get to hear about his wardrobe. (laughs) It's not the usual fare, even what he eats. He stands out. He's set apart. And he is calling people to repentance. What is repentance? Repentance, as we've talked about many times, is simply having a change of direction and mind that results in a change in behavior, right? He's calling them. And people are coming from everywhere. They're just streaming. They're hungry. They've been under the boot of Rome. They've been under, you know, the constraints of legalistic Judaism, And they're hungry and they're thirsty for something that is real life. They're recognizing that they fall short of God's standard and measurement of perfection. And so they come, crowds and crowds. And among them come the spiritual leaders. Coming to get baptized, coming to repent. Oh no. They're coming to spy. They're coming to see what's going on, what's causing a stir, what's causing a ripple in the pond. And John calls them on it. Why have you come here? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You know, you can have all the window dressing you want. You can look like a good Christian, amen? But on the inside, and when push comes to shove, and start, stuff starts coming out of your mouth that isn't godly, and stuff starts happening at your hands, your behavior is not Christ-like. It's not fruit that is in keeping with a life that has been turned around and following Jesus. And John is he's prophesying about his cousin, and apparently they don't really know each other. He, he knows of them, but they don't know them. In, he doesn't know him intimately. And he's saying that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come, and he's coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. What is fire? Fire cleanses, doesn't it? It, it burns up that which is perishable. And he talks about his threshing floor. Israel belonged to God. Amen? His threshing floor, his vineyard, his fields. He says he's coming to gather his wheat into the barn. And here's the cautionary tale. The chaff is going to get burned up with an unquenchable, an unstoppable fire. What is chaff? Anybody know what chaff is? Any farmers here? It's the husks, isn't it? It's the stuff that's not utilizable. It's the stuff that gets left behind on the table or on the threshing floor, so to speak. In Mark's gospel in the, uh, chapter 11, we read that following the triumphal entry, Jesus enters Jerusalem and he goes into the temple courts. It says he looked around at everything. How many of you know that when Jesus is looking around, he doesn't miss a thing? (laughs) We may think we got something covered up here or there, but Jesus has got eyes that see, amen? He looked at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. 
When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. And Mark adds, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he says, Is it not written, My house, my house, will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him. Because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. The whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So Jesus and the disciples often hung out in Bethany. Bethany was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They're very hospitable friends. And that's where they'd go and hang out, and then they'd go back and forth from Jerusalem to do ministry. We're going to come back to the fig tree because it's something that a lot of people stumble over. Some commentators say, see, Jesus was just a man like you and me. He wanted a snack. He went to the fridge, and Mama hadn't prepared any snacks. He was upset. He cursed the tree. Other people go to the other extreme and say, knowing, in part, that this is a parable, that this is an acted-out visual parable about what was going on with uh, Jerusalem, with, with Israel, Oh, see, the Jews were cursed. God's done with them now. No, that's not what was going on there. These two stories, the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple, are connected. Jesus had gone into the temple courts the night before, and he'd seen some things that displeased him. But it was night. Everything was shut up. You know, it's like going to the mall, and all those little kiosks are covered. And he came back, and he was angered at what he saw. Because the outer courts were supposed to be the place where the Gentiles were able to come and pray and worship God. You see, they weren't allowed because they were considered unclean. They couldn't go into the holy place. They couldn't go into the inner sanctuary. But they were welcomed, if they were God-fearing Gentiles, to worship in the outer courts. Kind of like if we just said, well, we've got a group of people. You can't come in the sanctuary, but you can stay in the entrance or the narthex. But at the same time, we decided we're going to sell a whole bunch of swag out there. And there's so much babble and cackling and going on that the people out there can't worship. Jesus said, my house, we call the house of prayer for all nations. Verse 19 says, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, so they've gone to Bethany and they're returning again. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you have cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Is that not astounding? If you believe in your heart without doubting, it will be done for you. What you do and what God does. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. And it will be 
yours. Now, this is not our favorite word faith preacher talking here. This is Jesus. Just in case you're tempted to discount this as, well, maybe that's just for some people. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. What is that? That is the not so small, small print. You can have this, but you just got to make sure that there's no unforgiveness that is clogging up that channel and that avenue of the life and the vitality and the power of God flowing through you. Amen? So what about these figs? What about this poor tree? In his work, uh, New Testament documents, are they reliable? The scholar F.F. F. Bruce points out that the given, given the time frame for Mark 11 being late March or early April, it was not uncommon for people to seek a knob-like fruit called tekush, tekush, something like that. <laughs> Don't test me on it. From the broad leaf displaying yet too early for figs on the fig producing tree. This was about six weeks before the fully formed fig appears. The fact that Mark adds these words shows that he knew what he was talking about. When the fig leaves appear about the end of March, they are accompanied by a crop of small little knobs called tekesh by the Arabs, a sort of forerunner of the real figs. These tekesh are eaten by peasants and others when hungry. They drop off before the real fig is formed. But if the leaves appear unaccompanied by tekesh, there will be no figs that year. So it was evident to our Lord when he turned aside to see if there were any of these tekush on the fig tree to feed himself, that the absence of these little tekush meant that there would be no figs when the time for figs came. For all of its fair show of foliage, it was a fruitless and hopeless tree. Israel and the Jews were often referred to as God's vineyard, to his fig tree. And there was more going on there than just was Jesus hungry and not getting a snack. There's an old hymn, nothing but leaves for the master. Listen to the words. The master is seeking a harvest. In lives he's redeemed by his blood. He seeks for the fruit of the Spirit and works that will glorify God. He looks for his likeness reflected in lives that are yielded and true. He's looking for zeal in the winning of souls he's entrusted to you. He's yearning for someone to carry the life-giving word far and near. He's waiting for hearts that are willing, for ears that are open to hear. And the course goes this way. Nothing but leaves for the master. Oh, how his loving heart grieves. When instead of the fruit he is seeking, we offer him nothing but leaves. Church, you and I have to ask ourselves from time to time. What are we offering our master what gift do we bring to the one who gave everything to give us life? What honor, what respect, what are we willing to sacrifice for the king and his kingdom? Right now there are people who are being killed, martyred for their faith because they will not recant their faith in Jesus Christ. People who walk for hours, sometimes days through the jungle to get together to a communal gathering place where it's safe to worship God. And we feel it a hardship to get up out of our clean, cozy beds and saunter over to church mid-morning or to drive in our cars.
Back in the day, some Christians thought they were doing a mighty fine work in their charitable giving to the missionaries who were in far off, hot and hostile lands. These benevolent saints would send nothing but the best of their cast-offs to the missionaries. Used tea bags. I mean, why would you want to send a fresh tea bag? Nylons with runs in them. Clothes with holes in them. In other words, garbage. Garbage. That which was of no longer any of use to them. Can you imagine being one of those missionaries receiving a long-awaited box of such gifts? Unpacking it. No thoughtfulness. No respect. No honor, no love. Luke 7, 36 through 50, we read in an account of someone who thought he was pretty hot stuff. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Do you see this woman, Simon? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Shalom, shalom. Nothing broken, nothing missing. You have been made whole. An alabaster jar was a vessel that was sealed. The contents inside precious. Oftentimes kept for the time of burial. That's how precious and expensive it was. 
When you opened a, an alabaster jar, there was no lid to unscrew and then put back after you'd taken out a drop or two and put it on. You had to break it. And all the contents were used up. This woman was a sinful woman. Some have said, well, maybe she was a prostitute. We don't know that. What we know is that she loved Jesus extravagantly. She left nothing on the table. She was all in. It was all or nothing. She sacrificed. She made a fool of herself. She had eyes only for the Savior. Her love for him trumped any other reservation, any other thing that would cause her reservation. Jesus was more. I want us to be clear. God is not looking for our money. But I'll just say this. For some of us, Money is our God because when it comes down to that's what our security's in. Let something happen with our money. <laughs> we lose our joy. We lose our peace. We start frothing at the corners of the mouth. God is not looking for our money. He is looking at and for our hearts. It was Jesus who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Church, what are we investing in? What are we investing in? A month or so ago, God gave me a dream, and it was so unusual that I journaled about it. In my dream, it was a, a tanker that was loaded to the hilt. Those shipping containers just stacked up so high. And as this, this uh, freighter started to pull out of the port, it started to list. And the people on the shore were like, oh my goodness. And it started to go into the water. And all of a sudden we could hear the screams of people who were trapped down in the holds, just like those slaves that were brought over. Down in the stinking holds. And frantically, I'm trying to get those containers out of the way. People perishing. It's not about stuff, it's about people. Jesus didn't give his life for stuff, he gave his life. For people. Oh, church, it wrecked me. It wrecked me. It was a pivotal moment. I don't care what people think of me. I have a job to do. People are perishing. They need life. In Luke 21, verses 1 through 4, Jesus has been talking about, again, he's con contrasting the, the spiritual leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. And he looks over, says he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The question is, when it comes to following Jesus, are we all in? Are we abiding in the vine? Are we producing abundant fruit? In Luke 13, verses 6 through 9, Jesus tells a parable. It goes this way. A man had a fig tree growing in his, his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it. 
but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then, then. Cut it down. Jesus again is talking about Israel. He is talking about the Jews, his people that he came to, that most of them did not recognize him. The ones that should have recognized him were completely blind. A man had a fig tree, a man named God, God the Father. Israel belongs to him, is his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it. He sent his son, the man who take care of the vineyard. For three years, three years, Jesus ministered, didn't he? Before they crucified him. For three years, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. Canary Church of God, we are a spiritual fig tree of sorts. The Lord is looking for fruit in and among us. Amen? It's what we're called for. It's what we're made for. I want you to hear God's heart. These have been some hmm, stringent words. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. People are saying, ah, the second coming hasn't happened. That's not happening. (laughs) That's just a pipe dream, you poor deluded folks. No. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand or count slowness. Instead, he is patient. King James Version says he is long-suffering with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God has given us everything in Christ Jesus Romans 8, 28 and through 32 says, we know in all things that God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What does that mean? We're growing up to look like Jesus. Every single one of us, that's our fruit. We should look like Jesus. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. God's doing all this amazing stuff for and in us. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who are we afraid of? Whose affirmation are we looking for? He who did not spare his own son. His own son. He didn't spare him. But gave him up for us all. For us all. Not just for the Jews. Not just for the wealthy. For everyone who believes. How will he not also along with him, along with him, graciously give us all things? Church, can you say all things? All things. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. What are we doing with those blessings? Have they been left sitting unused and called upon on the table? Jesus did not suffer and die just to give us a ticket to glory in the sweet by and by, as reassuring and as wonderful and as praiseworthy and hallelujah as that is. Amen? How many of you are glad you're going to heaven one day? Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly in the blessed here and now. Why? Because he desires and has provided for and expects fruit. Fruit. In the blessed here and now. 
And he's looking to see if there's some of those little prefigs, those to quash. Because we're not perfect yet. Amen? Anybody else out there? You're not quite there. The figs are not quite fully formed and mature. But I hope and pray we've got some little buds and some little knobs that are showing. And it's not just leaves happening, right? God's desire is that no one would perish, that no one would miss heaven, but that all would come to repentance. And we are his hands, we are his feet, we are his witnesses, we are his ambassadors, Christ's ambassadors. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. How's that going for us these days? How many others are we reconciling to Christ as he empowers us? It's expected of us. We've been given that ministry of reconciliation to a world that is estranged from him. What are we doing with the divine appointments and the God incidences that he's setting up for us? Are we leaving them on the table? Mark and I spent a a fair amount of time in Red Deer. We went and did some e-biking and stuff like that on the trails. They got amazing trails there if you ever get to, to Red Deer. And we decided we were making dinner for uh, the, the um, director of the, of the camp, of D, DVM. So we went to Safeway. Mark's good with Google. We found a Safeway, and there we got to Safeway. And lo and behold, it was closed for renovations. And we see a guy coming out. He's a workman. And so Mark says, hey, do you know any other grocery stores around here? And he says, well, does it matter where you go? Do you want to shop here? Do you want to shop here? IGA, will, will IGA work for you? Sure. The guy jumps in his truck like he's possessed, and he takes off like there's a, there, you know, there's a swarm of black African murder hornets on his tail. And we're trying to keep, keep up to him, and he's taking us on these back roads, and finally we get to whew, IGA. And we start shopping. And I'm going down an aisle, and I see a woman, a lovely dressed woman, kind-looking woman. She's First Nations, and I look at her, and I smile, and I say, hi. She says, hi, and I keep walking, and I feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit turn around and ask her how she's doing. So I turn around, and I look at her, and I say, how are you doing? And she says, not good. And so I come closer and lean in and I said, what's happening? She says, where I'm living, there's bad spirits that are coming against me. And I said, yeah, I know that, you know, in the First Nations culture, spirituality, there can be (laughs) bad spirits that come up against us. And she was hurting. She had arthritis. She had a bunch of stuff going on. I asked her if I could pray with her right there in the aisle of IGA. (laughs) We had prayer meeting. And we exchanged phone numbers. She called me yesterday. I'd left two messages. Nobody picked up. I thought, she gave me the wrong number. I was going to give it one more time. But she called me. Divine appointments. There was a reason why we had to drive like crazy to get there because there was a certain window of of opportunity that this woman was going to be in the aisle that I would be in. And we, God knew we needed to intersect. Amen. Amen. Let's not leave those opportunities. Let's make the most of them. Some of us have been doing our best to abide and be obedient to the Lord, but sometimes it feels like we're hitting one roadblock or challenge after another. It makes us question whether we've actually got a connection with God, whether he really loves us, or if his promises are actually for today and for us, or just other really righteous or needy people. At the worst, the onslaught of these challenges may cause us to question if God even exists. In John 6, 29, Jesus tells us the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. You want to know what your job description is? You you want to know how you're going to bear fruit and much abundant fruit? Believe in the one he has sent. John the Baptist had some questions in his mind. 
He was doing what God had foreordained and called him to do, preparing the way of the Messiah. And it landed him in jail. And it would ultimately cost him his head and his life. In Matthew 11, we read in verses 1 through 6 that after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his, his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Have you ever had those kind of questions? <laughs> when what you believe and what you're experiencing don't always seem to line up and you're wondering, did I miss something somewhere? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What is Jesus saying? Go back and tell John what you're seeing happening, what is happening under my ministry, the things that I am doing. But he's telling him more than this. He's reminding John, who is a prophet. Jesus called him the greatest prophet that had ever lived. He said, look, these things are happening. He's pointing him back to Isaiah 61. Isaiah, another prophet. This is what the Messiah is going to look like. This is what the Messiah is going to do. How many of you know that we, as Jesus is in the world, so are we. We are called to do those same things. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And we need to press into it, church. We stumble along at first. A baby cannot walk before it crawls. <laughs> Our grandson just started crawling. He's almost walking. We were wondering if it was going to happen because all he could do was scoot backwards for the longest time. <laughs> no forward motion. He's got that nailed down now. But what I want us to op understand, church, opportunities come with opposition. Opportunities come with opposition. Paul writes, in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, 9, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? A great door for effective work has opened to me. Opportunity. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> there are many who oppose me. Anybody experienced any opposition lately? Yeah, you don't have to put your hands up. Wink at me. Are you leaving anything on the table as we get ready to go to a time of worship and to communion? Are you leaving anything on the table? What are you leaving on the table? Are there areas of your life that you're not willing to give to God in complete surrender? Little pockets of disobedience that you're protecting and you're shielding. Are there opportunities to draw closer to God and his body to abide in him that you're leaving behind? You know, we're doing this Bible study, immerse all these scriptures about the Messiah. It's been offered to all of us. We've got maybe 15, 20 people who are doing it. Life groups, Sunday worship, eh, I'll take it or leave it. You know, one of the things that kind of gulls pastors is when they prepare to feed the sheep every Sunday. Hours wrestling with the word, God, what do you want for, to say to us this week? And then you have people who give you a call and say, Pastor, no, they haven't been in church for months. Months and months and months. Pastor, I just need four hours of your time just to sit down and talk about troubles I'm having. People, I'm preparing a banquet every week. I'm doing the best I can. I'm not perfect. But come and feed, and maybe God is going to show you through the word that he's giving your pastor some answers to the issues that you're dealing with. 
Maybe your faith is going to get stirred up so you can grab a hold of what he has promised you for yourself. I don't have to sit here and spoon feed the baby through the mustache. You know I say that in love, don't you? Because I'm preaching at me. I don't have a mustache yet. Give me another 20 years. I have a little hair that springs out here. Get the tweezers after it. You know I love you, amen? Do you know that the time is short? None of us knows what tomorrow holds. Are we leaving the greater gifts of the Spirit? We're moving towards Pentecost, and I tell you, we're going to get into what it looks like to live the resurrected life in the power of God's Holy Spirit. If we say we are the church that believes in God the Father and Jesus the Son, but the Holy Spirit, you could just sit outside. We're going to have nothing, got nothing, because He is the power, He is the presence. He is the vitality that flows through the vine to us. If we don't have him, we got nothing. We might as well pack it up and go home. 1 Corinthians in closing, really closing. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. Now you collectively are Christ's body and individually... You are members of it, each with his own special purpose and function. So God is appointed and placed in the church for his own use. First apostles chosen by Christ. Second prophets who foretell the future. Those who speak a new message from God to the people. Third teachers, then those who work miracles. Then those with the gifts of healings, the helpers, the administrators, and speakers in various kinds of unknown tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly, King James Version says covetously, covetously. That's the only time we're commanded to covet. Covet and strive for the greater gifts If acquiring them is going to be your goal. Greater gifts, church. We need to move in the power and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. But we need also to have the fruit, the character of the Holy Spirit. The nature of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because he says in that last part of verse 31. And yet I will show you a still a more excellent way. One of the choicest graces and the highest of them all. Unselfish love unselfish love. Do you love the Lord this morning? Do you love his body? Jesus said that the world would recognize us as his disciples, not by our great music, not by our great preaching, but by our love for one another. Let's stand as we prepare to worship. Thank you, Jesus. Sarah, we're just going to do the first couple of songs there and then go to um, communion. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Father. Well, communion is going to be a wee bit different today. I love what Pastor Cindy was sharing about not leaving anything on the table. Mark 4.28 tells us that the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that, the full grain in the head. There's steps with God. In everything that we do, there's steps with God. He promised us in his word that if we seek first the kingdom of God, all of these things would be added unto you. you would, he would meet all of our needs. But what was the first step? to seek the kingdom of God. Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. He, he became the bridge between us as humans here on earth and all the provisions of heaven. The verse we just heard was, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all your needs would be met. I want to challenge us today that you're not here by chance. You're not part of this body by chance. And in order to have all of your needs met, you need to believe that, that 
you being here is part of God's plan and that as you seek him first, he will meet all your needs. I don't know what your needs are today. Jesus does. I don't know what struggles you've been going through. But I'm here to tell you that God's word says that if we'll seek him, he will meet all of our needs. Pastor Cindy talked today about the fruit. And I want to challenge us that unless you start taking steps of faith, you will never see God's best. The fruit, have you noticed the fruit grows at the end of the limb? So if you don't get out on a limb sometime, you're not going to enjoy the fruit. I am sharing with you. I'm not speaking to you. I'm sharing with you what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about today. So this is more for me than it is for you. The Word of God was written to our hearts, not our head. You must read it with your heart, and God's Word will change you on a heart level, not a mind level. Actions are just the outflow of the changes in our hearts. Start letting the Word disciple you, and you will be transformed. You won't even have to try and change. It will just be a natural outflow. A fruit doesn't scream when it's developing. Let the Word of God transform you. When Jesus was having the Last Supper with his disciples, he lifted up the bread and he said, every time you partake, remember me. And I'm challenging you today that we need to spend time in the Word and allow it to transform us from the inside out. So when Jesus paid the price with his broken body, it was to be that bridge for us so that we can shine brightly in this world and be, be the answer to what people are looking for. So as we partake together, just take a moment to remember that Jesus paid a price in full. Mm -hmm. And are we living up to that? Are we living up to everything he's paid for? Let's thank Jesus now for the price he paid with his body. Let's partake together. And in the same fashion, he held up the cup that was full of wine and it symbolized his precious blood that he shared for us. That blood was like the signature on a contract. It sealed it that nobody could challenge the authority. And so as we hold up this cup with juice that symbolizes Jesus' blood. Let's remember that we can walk in the authority and the power because Jesus sealed that covenant with his blood. Let's partake together. Thank you, Father. We'd like to just take a moment, ushers, um, to receive this morning's offering. 
would like brother Craig you want to come come on up and we're gonna put these uh, new drums to the test this morning as we celebrate as we go out talking about leaving nothing on the table uh, our brother John has um, started what is it ten years ago now nine years ago the Pass Creek Gospel Music Festival and uh, we're preparing for that uh, Yana our sister from the Ukraine and myself are going to be headlining and uh, the team was practicing he here yesterday so these drums are going to live here and uh, we're going to call forth some drummers out of the congregation amen <laughs> amen let's bless the offering father god we just thank you for this opportunity to worship you with our tithes and our offerings father we just thank you that uh, you're a good good father and you, this entire earth is your footstool you own it all so when we give you 10% of our earnings, we're just giving back what's already yours. It's all yours. Mm -hmm. But we're just showing that we trust you, we honor you, we worship you with our offerings. We just thank you, Father, now that uh, for the faithfulness, the generosity, and the love that people express to this ministry by being so faithful. Bless them now, Father. Bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can join us standing when you're ready.
Amen. Bless you guys. We love you. Kelly, is there anything downstairs? There are some goodies downstairs, some refreshments uh, for folks. And yes, make sure that you greet one another, and uh, especially our newcomers. Welcome, welcome.